pressure to invite professor additional Although he is very famous all over the world, everybody here knows him. He is some of his distinguished achievements. He is now a professor of physical mentality at the University of Cambridge. He got his PhD degree in mentality and material science at the University of Cambridge in 1979. He was elected to be a fellow of the Royal Society in 1998 in the English or And further, he was elected to be a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering in 2002 for the English or English language. He is a public name over. Hundred ninety. Uh, 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 he has a cultivated many students. For example, a PhD degree over fifty five, and a master degree over ten person. And he also fifteen scientists over thirty six sources. Postdoctor over 30 years ago. He is a very distinguished student. And this afternoon, Professor Patricia is very kind to give us two talks. One is about pain and transformation, and the other one is about steel. These two steers are also under development in CSU. I think. Today's lecture give us the presentation of our study. Please welcome Professor So first of all, thank you very much for those kind words. And let me say I'm delighted to be here for the first time in China State. And already I have had uh, a look at your hot strip, uh, your hot rolling mill. And later on I'm going to have the pleasure of looking at the TMCP. Yeah, so thank you very much. And I'm also very pleased that all of you have come to listen about Bainan. Okay, wonderful material. So, I don't know if this translates correctly, but I understood this was the meaning of Bainan. <laughs> but I'm sure this is correct. <laughs> so, I'm going to talk about the mechanism of the Bainan transformation in steel. And it would be good if you just interrupt me if you have any questions at any time. Yeah best to immediately interrupt and then we can talk about it. Now, this is the phase diagram for pure iron. Okay, so this is without any alloying elements at all. And this is ferrite, body-centered cubic crystal structure. This is austenite, which has the face-centered cubic crystal structure. And this, of course, is also ferrite, which happens at very high temperatures. This is a very unusual feature of iron, that it is first body-centered cubic at ambient pressure, then it becomes austenite, and then it becomes ferrite again. And that's because there are complicated magnetic transitions in all of these phases. Okay, so even austenite has magnetic transitions in it. So you know, if I add 30% nickel to the austenite, it will become ferromagnetic just like ferrite, because there are magnetic transitions in the austenite. If I increase the pressure enormously to 130,000 atmospheres, then I get hexagonal flows like iron. So without adding any alloying elements at all, you know, we have three different crystal structures, and each of these crystal structures has very important magnetic transformations in them. If those magnetic transformations didn't exist, then we wouldn't have ferrite at room temperature. We would have hexagonal flows back iron, and China steel wouldn't exist because hexagonal iron has very bad properties, like most hexagonal metals. So magnetism is very important. Now, of course, then we start adding alloying elements and so forth and make the steel much more complicated. And we can have many, many different kinds of phases and a huge range of properties as well. 
that's what makes iron so tremendously successful. You know, we are using more than a billion tons every year of iron. Okay? And the general public thinks of all those billion tons as just a piece of steel. Okay? That's because the technology is so good, they don't need to worry about it. It's only when your computer crashes that you worry about how it is made. Okay? Because you are so successful in making good steel, everybody thinks steel is steel. <laughs> okay? But that's a good sign, not a bad sign. So today, of course, I'm only going to focus on these two crystal structures, which are illustrated here. So this is the body-centered cubic crystal structure of ferrite and the face-centered cubic crystal structure of austenite. Now, there are different ways in which we can transform one into the other, how, how we can transform austenite into ferrite. And there are two essential ways in which we can do this. Supposing that I have this as my austenite, and I have two different elements in it, say manganese and iron. Okay, so the square atoms are the manganese atoms. And this is the unit cell of the crystal. I can change that into the unit cell of ferrite by physically deforming the pattern. Okay? So the way in which these atoms are arranged is altered by putting a deformation, a homogeneous deformation. There's no need for any diffusion in this process. We are deforming it into a different crystal structure. So you can see that this atom and this atom are in exactly the same relative positions. So there is an atomic correspondence between positions here and here. And that's, of course, how we get the shape memory effect. Yeah, because we haven't lost the near neighbor position during a transformation like this. And this is a displacement transformation. Chemical composition here is exactly the same as the chemical composition here because there's no diffusion. But notice one very important thing that obviously if we change the way in which the atoms are arranged by deformation, then the external shape of the crystal must change. And this is a very, very large deformation. You know, if I ask you a question, what is the size of a typical elastic strain in steel? What is the magnitude of a typical elastic strain? Any ideas? Yeah? Yeah, it's very, very small. It's about 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 3. The strain over here, the shear, is 0 0.26. Huge deformation. Okay. And remember that it's going to happen surrounded by a lot of material. So it's going to try and push against all that material. So there will be a huge strain energy. So these transformations are dominated by strain energy. Now the second way of changing the crystal structure is I break all the bonds here and I rearrange the atoms into the new pattern without altering the shape. Okay? Now in order to do that, you can imagine it to happen like this, and then I cut this triangle off, and I transport it on this side. And that transportation is a diffusion. So this kind of a reaction must involve long-range diffusion. Even if it happens in pure iron, you have to diffuse the iron atoms to get rid of the shape change. So this is reconstructive transformation. This is how uh, you know electromorphic ferrite and perlite I'm going to focus on this mechanism and the way I'm going to start is by presenting you with all the observed features of Baynard, all the experimentally observed features of Baynard, and then we can interpret how the actual transformation happens. Well, the first thing is you get two different kinds of Baynard. Uh, you, know, you can go back to 1956 when transmission electron microscopy was being applied to steels and you will find two classifications, upper bainite and lower bainite. And in upper bainite, you have these plates of ferrite, which are about a quarter of a micrometer in thickness, and cementite particles in between the plates. And this forms at a relatively high temperature. Lower bainite, you have some precipitates of cementite also inside the plates of bainite. And obviously, because some of the carbon is tied up here, these particles will be smaller. 
And this is one of the reasons why lower bainite has a higher toughness, even though it is stronger than upper bainite. It's because these particles are not as coarse as over here. Okay. Now, whatever theory you propose, it has to explain why we get lower bainite at low temperature, why we get upper bainite at high temperature. Whatever mechanism you propose has to explain all the observed features. So this is one of the features. And just to show you some typical micrographs, this is half a bainite here. And you can see the plates here. And you can see the particles in between. And, whoops, sorry. Yeah, this is lower bainite, where you can see these particles of cementite <coughs> inside the plates and also in between the plates of ferrite. But notice this is very, very fine now. That's why we have higher toughness with lower bainite, even though it is a stronger phase than upper bainite. Okay, so this is just experimental observation so far. Very, very well established. Lots and lots of people have reported such observations. Now, the second thing uh, that we need to understand is that bainite is always in the form of a plate. Okay, now, this is a very, very nice micrograph taken by Srinivasan and Varsan, uh, Srinivasan and Raymond in 1968. And this is a technique that we seem to have forgotten. Here we are looking at two different surfaces. Okay. We are looking at a specimen which is shaped like that. So we can follow what happens to a face across the edge here. And we get a three-dimensional image of the bayonet. And you can see that in three dimensions, it is a plate shape. That is very important. One other thing I'd like you to notice in this very old optical micrograph is that, look, there seems to be something inside here. Okay? It's not, there's some structure inside this region which has a scale here, which is many, many micrometers in size. So typically here, you're talking about 10, 20 micrometers in thickness. But if you look in detail, there is something going on inside that plate. The whole, this is the reason why this is etching very dark compared with the mining site here, which is etching very light. Whenever you know something etches dark, that means there is a lot of structure inside. Now, the reason why it's a plate shape is very straightforward. Uh, if you work out the elastic strain energy per unit volume because of the shape change, and this is a shear deformation of about 0.26, and this is a volume change of about 0.03, okay. then the elastic strain energy per unit volume is related to the shear strain, the volume change, and the shear modulus of the austenite, and the thickness over the length. So obviously, this is minimum when we have a plate shape. Okay. Now, the origin of this equation is very simple to explain. Yeah. First of all, if I plot, uh, if I plot stress versus strain, the elastic part, then the area under this curve is simply the strain energy per unit volume. Okay. So the area under that curve is half stress times strain, which is equivalent to half the modulus. Um, hang on, stress. Of modulus times strain, so uh, epsilon squared times the modulus. Okay. So you can see we have the strain squared times the modulus. Now, why do we have the thickness to length ratio? Well, if this is my austenite and I transform it to bainite, that's the shape change. And you can see these displacements here. They increase as I move away from this plane. So if I make this into a thin plate, then the displacement is very small, isn't it? And that's the reason why the best shape to minimize the strain energy is a thin plate. Okay. Of course, uh, this shape deformation, the shear strain and so on, is not imaginary. It really happens. If I take a specimen of austenite and polish it completely flat, mirror finish, okay, 
then I allow it to transform to bainite, then I will, I will see the shear deformation. Okay. Now, bainite is usually extremely fine. You know, it's less than a quarter of a micrometer in thickness. Martensite can be much coarser. So the shape deformation of martensite has been established for a very long time because you can do it using optical interference microscopy. With bainite, that's much more difficult because you are close to the resolution limit of light. Yeah, light has a wavelength of about half a micrometer and you are trying to resolve 0.2 of a micrometer. Okay. So this is not taken using an optical micrograph, but it's taken using an atomic force microscope, okay, which looks at surface topography. Uh, so this is austenite transformed to plates of bainite and you can see the enormous shear which you can measure quantitatively and it's about 0.26. There's one other thing I want you to notice very carefully from this, is that this is the plate of bainite. You can see that the adjacent austenite is also deformed. You see this region here is deformed. The reason is that at the temperatures where bainite forms, austenite is quite weak. Its yield strength is low. If you're going to deform by a shear strain of 0 0.26, that you can't accommodate that elastically in the ostinate. Right. So you deform the adjacent ostinate, and that has a very, very large effect. It has a very large effect because when you have a displacing transformation, if you put any obstacles in its way, you will retard that transformation. Because the interface consists of a set of dislocations any obstacles you put in the path of the dislocations will stop that interface. Yeah. So this deformation which is generated by the bainite actually stops this plate from growing. And in a transition electron micrograph, this is the interface here between the austenite and the bainite, and you can see a huge array of dislocations. That basically prevents the interface from moving once it gets to a critical density. So when you look at an optical micrograph of bainite and look at the scale at 50 micrometers, that is not a single plate of bainite. If I take that same plate and show you what it looks like in a transmission microscope, it consists of thousands of very, very, very small plates which grow to a certain size and stop growing even though the austenite grain size is much bigger. Okay. So optically this looks like a single plate of bainite, but it consists of a plate which grows, stops, you then nucleate another plate, it stops, and you carry on into a collection of plates which we call a sheaf of bainite. Okay. So notice that the size of the plate here is the same as the size of the plate here. What's happening is that the shear deformation generates so many dislocations in the austenite that the interface becomes blocked. The plate cannot grow anymore. Now that's very good for mechanical properties because if this was a martensite plate, its size would be that big. Okay? But here we have a further grain size refining effect and that is that the plate stops itself. And that's why the thickness remains around a quarter of a micrometer. Now there is no thermomechanical process which can produce a grain size of a quarter of a micrometer. Here you have a grain size of a quarter of a micrometer naturally by phase transformation. So the structure that we see inside this optical micrograph of Vena is actually thousands of very, very small platelets Growing, stopping, growing, stopping, and so on. So why, why the smart inside uh, do not have this kind of thing? Yeah. For, for stop, for stop. That's right. So it's a very good question. The reason is, it's a lower temperature and the austenite is stronger. Now, supposing that you make one inside at a high temperature, yeah, by making the MS temperature high, you get exactly the same. Or, if you deform the austenite and then form martensite, again, it will stop growth, stop growth. Okay. 
So, you know, when you do thermal mechanical processing, it accelerates the formation of electromoving ferrite because that's a transformation which is like re recrystallization. Any defects are destroyed when ferrite forms. Here, if you deform the austenite before the transformation, you actually retard it. Okay? You reduce the rate of transformation. Okay, so we've seen that the transformation uh, has a shape deformation, which is a shear plus a volume change. Uh, there is a thin plate shape, which is consistent with minimization of strain energy. Let's look at what happens to the different kinds of atoms when we form vanite. Okay. Now, I'm just going to switch off the lights for a short time because it's difficult otherwise to see. Are the lights switched off? Or? Okay, this is enough. I think. Good. Okay, so we're going to look at individual atoms. Right, this is, these are images taken using a field iron microscope where you can see individual atoms and you can identify what those individual atoms are. And the first image here shows you an interface between the bainite on this side and austenite on this side. So all the atoms are being imaged here. Here we are only imaging the iron atoms. Here we are only imaging the silicon atoms. And here we are only imaging the carbon atoms. Now you can see that the iron atoms, silicon atoms, are perfectly homogeneously distributed. Yeah. There's not even segregation at the interface because it's a coherent interface. So we can conclude from many, many experiments like this that there is absolutely no partitioning of substitutional solutes on the finest conceivable scale. That means you cannot get a finer scale than this. No question, there is absolutely no partitioning of substitution of solids during the Bainite transformation. Of course, that is consistent with a displacement. But look what's happened to carbon. Can you see that the carbon has partitioned into the austenite? There's almost no carbon on this side. Okay. So, do we conclude from this that carbon diffuses during the Bainite transformation? Or is it the case that the carbon has moved after the bainite is formed? Okay. So we need to investigate that because carbon has a very high diffusion coefficient. And it is possible that it has partitioned into the austenite after diffusionless growth. So if we do a calculation of the time that is required for carbon to partition into the austenite, so we can imagine that the bainite forms exactly like martensite here. But carbon then escapes into the austenite and it can precipitate as cementite. And if we reduce the transformation temperature, then there's also an opportunity to precipitate inside the plate of bainite and some carbon partitions and we end up with a lower bainite. So this is a possible mechanism. Let's investigate how much time it takes for this carbon to escape. Well, here is a calculation of the time required to decarburize a plate of bainite as a function of temperature. And you can see that you know, it's, it's a fraction of a second. So by the time you do the experiment, it will have changed. So there is no experiment you can do in which you can find the carbon inside the plate, even if it was there at the beginning. This is a problem, isn't it? Because we want to know the mechanism of transformation. And by looking at it, we can't say whether the carbon was there in the bainite or it was never there and always diffused during transformation. Well, there is, there is one hope. Okay. And that comes from thermodynamics. So let's imagine that we are plotting the free energy versus the carbon concentration. And this is the free energy curve for ferrite, and this is the free energy curve for austenite at a particular temperature, T1. Now, to find the equilibrium composition of austenite and ferrite, you draw a common tangent here, 
And that gives you the equilibrium composition of phosphonate and the equilibrium composition of ferrite at this temperature T1. And that's how we construct the phase diagram from thermodynamic data. Uh, this phase boundary is the A3 phase boundary of the iron carbon phase diagram and this is the A1 phase boundary of the iron carbon phase diagram. And that's how you know your thermocalc works, for example. To calculate the phase diagram, you take the free energy curve and you draw common tangents in the computer and that gives you the equilibrium composition of the austenite and ferrite. So I want to focus on a different part of the phase diagram, which is this point here, where austenite and ferrite of exactly the same chemical composition have exactly the same free energy. Right. Now, what is the importance of this? Well, the importance is that if I have austenite of this composition and I transform it to ferrite without any change in composition, I get an increase in free energy. And that's not allowed. You know, a reaction will not happen if it increases free energy. It can only happen if it decreases free energy. Okay. So we can conclude that austenite, which has a carbon concentration more than this point, cannot transform without diffusion. On the other hand, austenite of this composition can, because you will get a reduction in free energy. So if I plot this point as a function of temperature, we get what's called the T0 line. On this side of the T0 line, it's impossible to get diffusionless transformation. On this side, the austenite can, in principle, transform without any diffusion of carbon. Let me explain that a bit more. So this now, I'm just plotting the T0 curve here on the phase diagram. If I form a plate of bainite in a steel of this composition, without diffusion, but the carbon then escapes into the austenite, then the next plate of bainite has to form from austenite which is richer in carbon. And similarly, the plate after that has to form from austenite which is even richer in carbon. But this process can only continue until you hit the T0 curve. After that, diffusionless transformation is impossible. On the other hand, if carbon diffuses during transformation, there's no reason why it can't continue up to the A3 curve. So supposing we measure the point where the bainite reaction stops, then we could decide whether it's diffusionless transformation or carbon diffuses during transformation. Everybody happy with that? So look, this is just one of many, many experimental results which show that the transformation stops a long way before equilibrium is reached in the austenite. So we can conclude that even though when we make an observation, the carbon is in the austenite, not in the ferrite, during growth, the bainite grows just like martensite without any diffusion of carbon. Once we accept that, there are many other predictions you make, many predictions, all of which can be experimentally verified. So let us accept that bainite formed without any diffusion. Well, the first thing is that if we measure the growth rate, it should be much, much faster than allowed by carbon diffusion, okay? because the diffusion happens after growth. Um, okay, um, before I show you the growth rates, obviously, um, if I lower the transformation temperature, I can get more bainite before transformation stops. And that's why when you do a dilatometer experiment for bainite, near the BS temperature, there is no transformation, very, very little transformation here. As I lower, I get a lot more transformation, lower temperature, I get more transformation. Notice that this bainite star temperature is well below the temperature at which ferrite can form. Yeah. The A3 temperature is where ferrite formation starts. And yet, at about 480 degrees centigrade, I have no transformation to bainite. And the reason is that we are above the T0 curve at 480. 
So it explains what you observe using dilatometry that the amount of transformation increases from zero at the BS temperature to more and more beta as we go below the BS temperature. Above BS, there is no beta form, even though ferrite can form. So, uh, growth is diffusionless, and in any calculation of growth rate, we must take account of the strain energy because of the shape change. And I want to show you now uh, an experiment in which we are observe, observing using electron microscopy the growth of bainite in an instrument called a photoemission emission electron microscope. Okay. So we are actually going to see pictures at one second intervals, and you will see plates of bainite growing from here at the isothermal transmission temperature. So observe closely. This is all lower bainite. 
this is martensite and this is perlite. So you go directly from perlite to lower bainite to martensite. There is no upper bainite. Okay. Similarly, Omori and Honeycomb around the 1970s published this diagram uh, where you can see that for carbon concentrations which are less than 0.4, You'd go directly from upper uh, from perlite to upper bainite to martensite. There's no lower bainite. Okay. So the model quantitatively predicted these effects, which had not been noticed by the people who wrote the papers. Okay. People imagined that you always get perlite, upper bainite, lower bainite, and martensite, but that isn't true. If you have a sufficiently low carbon concentration. You will not get low bainite because the carbon can escape quickly before it can precipitate. If you have a sufficiently high carbon concentration, then the carbon can't escape fast enough and you will get a lower bainite microstructure. Right. Now I can present you with a lot more evidence about the growth part, but let's say that we accept that growth is diffusionless. We now need to think broadly. We need to think, okay, you know, if growth is diffusionless, what is the difference between bainite and martensite? And indeed, what is the difference between bainite and weedman starting carbon? So I'm now going to go into nucleation here. And remember that nucleation is a very, very difficult process to study because after all, you know, you're dealing with very, very small sizes and it's almost impossible to observe a nucleation event. But there are things we can do to get quantitative information about nucleation. So again, if I go back to my uh, free energy curves, this is the free energy curve of ferrite and of austenite, and I want to define two terms. First of all, this is the driving force here, delta G gamma alpha, for diffusionless transformation. So if I go from austenite of this composition to this, this free energy change I will label as delta G gamma alpha. Okay. On the other hand, if I nucleate a phase but allow carbon to diffuse, then I get a much larger free energy change here, okay. which I will call delta G M. So what I want to do is I want to discover whether during nucleation the nucleus is also forming without any diffusion or whether carbon has to diffuse during nucleation. Because the nucleus is completely different from a grown particle. The surface takes up a huge amount of free energy. So it may be the case that nucleation requires the diffusion of carbon, but growth does not. Okay. Because when you have a small particle, the surface is extremely important. Right, now this is a typical time temperature transformation diagram uh, where here is the C curve for electromorphic ferrite for perlite which are diffusional transformations and this is a C curve for all the transformations where you see a shape change, a shear deformation. Okay. And these C curves are character characterized by a flat top here which has a temperature which I'll call T with a subscript H. So for every alloy, I can find two C curves and I can define this temperature TH. And I want to find out you know, how much driving force I have available at this temperature TH. So I can do a calculation of the free energy change involved uh, during the diffusion of carbon and nucleation for a given steel and I will get a, a line like this as a function of temperature. The driving force increases as I increase the undercooling. And that driving force has a particular value at the temperature TH. Okay. So I get one point there for a particular steel. If I now do the same calculation but for a different steel so that the temperature TH is different and the driving force is different, 
then I might get another point here and this is for another scale and another scale and another scale. So by looking at a large number of scales, I can define the minimum amount of driving force I need in order to nucleate payment. And each point on this line represents a different alloy. Okay. So this is one steel, this is another steel, another steel, and so on. And I can do this calculation in two ways. In one case, I allow carbon to diffuse during nucleation. In the other case, I don't. So this is a case where I assume that nucleation is diffusionless. Now, one thing you notice immediately is that, look, if I assume diffusionless nucleation, I actually get a positive free energy change in some cases, and that's not possible. You cannot have a, an increase in free energy during nucleation. So, my conclusion is that during nucleation, we must have the diffusion of carbon. And this is what distinguishes bainite from martensite. In the case of martensite, both nucleation and growth are diffusion. And this is the reason why we see a C curve for bainite. Whereas for martensite, we have a straight line. Now, one other thing from this, if I, if I join up all these dots, I get a really nice straight line. Okay. In other words, this is the definition of the free energy change I need to start the bainite reaction. Once I have this line, I can calculate the Bainite start temperature for any steel. All I have to do is find the temperature at which the driving force becomes this value. So this is what I call the nucleation function for Bainite. But I would, I would be a lot happier if I could explain why that is a straight line. If I could have some physics which tells me that it should be a straight line. Otherwise, it's just an empirical equation. Now you might have seen a paper recently by Hillard in Metallurgical Transactions where he basically copies our line but calls it a different mechanism of nucleation without any explanation. Okay. He says you require a diffusional undercooling but no explanation for that undercooling. What I'm going to do now is show you why this is a straight line and of course this was published back in 1981, but he has completely ignored the paper. He's used exactly the same graphs from the paper, but ignored the rest of the paper. Okay. <laughs> right, so, uh, why does the free energy vary linearly with temperature, the free energy required for nucleation? Well, let me first of all uh, show you the mechanism of nucleation. And I'm not going to do it for ferrite because it's much more complicated to go from austenite to ferrite than from austenite to hexagonal iron. Okay? Because austenite, you can think about as the stacking of close-packed layers of atoms in a sequence A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. So if I take 1, 1, 1 planes and I stack them, then I will get a stacking sequence A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, and that's the structure of austenite. With hexagonal iron, it's exactly the same, but the sequence is A, B, A, B, A, B. Yeah, I've put layers in the sequence A, B, A, B, A, B. So it's very easy to see how to go from this to this. We simply shear the layers so that the stacking sequence A, B, C changes into A, B, A, B. Yeah. And that, of course, is the stacking fault that you see in austenite. When you see a stacking fault, the local sequence has changed from ABC, ABC to AB, AB. So, these are stacking faults in austenite, and this is work done in 1979. And here, locally, we have what we think is hexagonal close back to iron. Now, how do we prove that this is hexagonal close back to iron? that this is really a nucleus of hexagonal flow back iron. Well, actually, austenite is not the most dense form of iron. Yeah. Hexagonal flow back iron is 
even denser than austenite. So you get a volume contraction when hexagonal flux back ion forms. Now, in a transmission electron microscope, if I image this stacking pole using a G vector, which is at 90 degrees to the fold vector, then this fold should disappear. Okay? Over here. You can see this is the same region, the fold has disappeared. Right? But notice it hasn't completely disappeared. Okay? You can see some residual contrast here. That residual contrast comes from the volume change. So this is a really beautiful experiment by Loretto and Smallman which is direct evidence that a single second fold is a nucleus. And they change the concentration of cobalt and the volume change increases or decreases and the contrast changes as well. So we have proof that a stacking fold is a nucleus for hexagonal flow back down. And of course the stacking fold develops by a dislocation dissociating. Okay, so you have a perfect dislocation which changes into two partial dislocations. So it's a, it's a mechanism which involves the glide of dislocations, the shear deformation. Now, for austenite to ferrite, it is much more complicated. Much more complicated. You can see this. Okay, so I won't go into the details. But essentially, it is still the dissociation of dislocation. It has to happen in three dimensions because you can't change austenite into ferrite by a shear. Okay. So I don't want you to worry about details. I just want you to notice that we start with a perfect dislocation. It then dissociates and creates a fold here, which is your body centered cubic lattice. Okay. Now, given that this is involving the movement of dislocations, we should be able to use dislocation theory to treat the nucleation process. There's a lot of dislocation theory. Okay. So we can write the energy of this fault as a contribution from the free energy difference between austenite and ferrite. There will be strain energy because you've got dislocations, shearing, and there will be a surface energy term here which depends on the thickness of the fault. From dislocation theory, you can also write the fault energy in terms of a shear stress and the Burgess vector of the dislocation. So we can then equate these two terms here and get the activation energy for nucleation in terms of a shear stress. And that shear stress is this one, which is a function of the chemical driving force. So we get a relationship that the activation energy for nucleation is directly related to the chemical free energy change. This is completely different from classical nucleation theory. Okay. Let me just show you classical nucleation theory where we get this kind of a relationship. So the prediction is that if nucleation happens by the dissociation of dislocations, then the activation energy should be proportional to the free energy change as opposed to inverse square dependence. So let's go back. Um, I can now write my nucleation rate as a function of the activation energy. Okay. And I know that the activation energy varies directly with temperature because the free energy varies directly with temperature. Uh, where this is just a rearrangement of this equation. And therefore, I find that the free energy required for nucleation is directly proportional to the temperature. In other words, we have completely explained this trace line relationship where we see the free energy being proportional to temperature for nucleation. So we have a physical mechanism to explain why this should be a straight line. Now, today I'm not going to go into another piece of work which we have done recently which is where we decided to find the lowest temperature at which Bainite forms. Okay. Now, if I didn't have a theory to explain that this should be a straight line, then I would not be able to extrapolate this to room temperature. 
given that I have a theory to explain that straight line, I can be happy that I can produce Bainite at room temperature if I want. Okay, so to summarize, the nucleation of bainite must involve the partition of carbon. It is not possible to nucleate bainite unless carbon can partition. But otherwise, the mechanism is identical to that of martensite, involving the dissociation of dislocations. Right, and I need to also show you how we do a calculation of the MS temperature, the martensite start. Well, that is very, very easy. Everything is diffusionless. Nucleation is diffusionless. Growth is diffusionless. So basically, when the free energy change for diffusionless transformation reaches a critical value, we get martensite. So it's very easy to calculate the martensite start temperature in any steel. All we have to find is the temperature at which the free energy reaches a critical value. <coughs> Okay, I, I said I wasn't going to show you, but I forgot I put the slide in because it's too exciting. Okay. Uh, now, this, this is a scale in Kelvin. Yeah, so room temperature is approximately here. Uh, no, that's 100. But yeah, room temperature is approximately here. <coughs> and these are all calculations for uh, an alloy of this composition. And notice that I can go below room temperature here to get Bainer. I can continue this calculation, you know, to as high a carbon concentration oh, as I want. You uh, really do uh, the down uh, the experiments. Yeah. So I'm going. I'm going to show you. <laughs> uh, it's very exciting, isn't it? <laughs> you can't wait. <laughs> so in principle, we can produce bainite at whatever temperature we want because the martin star temperature remains below bainite. Okay. Now, of course. This is all thermodynamics. We also need to think about kinetics. Yeah. How long will it take to form bainite? And we can do that calculation because I've got nucleation theory, I've got growth theory. Here is the kinetics. So we are plotting carbon here. And here I would take one year to start the transformation. If I go to 1.5, it would take about 100 years. <laughs> Now we have made we have made an alloy with 1.5 carbon, and we have put it inside a sealed quartz tube with all the information in there, the time when the experiment started, and I expect my future generations of students <laughs> to verify this theory. Okay? So it's like a time capsule. We have made this, but given that the PhD project lasts for three years, we design an alloy which should transform in 10 days. And the transformation temperature is at 125 degrees centigrade. And that's the lowest ever transformation temperature. So do you have any measure to accelerate the reaction? Yeah, you are asking exactly the right questions. Uh, I will show you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so before I show you, what would you do to accelerate the transformation? And maybe some alloy elements. Yeah, and which alloy elements? <laughs> you are absolutely right. Something like a silicon. A silicon I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to increase its habitability. Yeah, yeah. Silicon doesn't, it's a neutral sort of element. Neutral. Yeah, but which two elements increase the free energy difference between us and the ferrite? Do you know? Hmm? Somebody said it. Uh, manganese decreases. Yeah. So cobalt. Cobalt and aluminium. Okay. So I will show you later on. I'll show you some data for that. Okay. This is absolutely spectacular image. Yeah. I want you to look at the scale here. Yeah. If you can't see it, please get up because it's very important. <laughs> it's 20 nanometers thickness. Yeah. These are plates of bainite produced at 125 degrees centigrade. Large sample of steel, no rapid cooling, no deformation. 
we naturally produce a great size of 20 nanometers, extremely cheap. What more can you ask for? <laughs> yeah. We can produce a grain size of 20 nanometers. This is the hardest bainite ever produced. It's got a hardness of about 790 rigors. And it has a toughness of about 40 megapascal root meters. And it's a dirty steel. Yeah. We have inclusions about 2 micrometers in size. It took 10 days. Yeah. Okay, now given that, um, uh, you know, Lee has asked the question about accelerating, I just need to load another, another slide which I wasn't going to show today. weight percent of cobalt or 2 weight percent of aluminium and you can see that the transformation time goes down from days to hours. My own opinion is that a slow transformation is a good thing yeah? because if you have a large lump of material it will reach a homogeneous temperature before transformation starts. So if you have no problems about residual stresses and so forth and so on. Of course, if you are making a small component, then maybe you want a, a faster transformation. Yeah. But simply by increasing the free energy difference between austenite and ferrum, you can accelerate the transformation without altering the temperature. Look at the hardness values. This is bainite. Right, I've explained to you the mechanism of bainite, that it is a displacive transformation. It's very, these arguments are very silly about diffusion and displacing. You can see the displacements yeah, in front of your eyes. There's no question it's a displacive transformation. Transformation temperature is higher than martensite, grows without diffusion, but carbon escapes into the austenite. The shape deformation is plastically accommodated. That means it causes deformation of the adjacent austenite. And that's why we have this subunit mechanism of growth and nucleation must involve partitioning. Now, there's another way of looking at mechanisms of transformation. Let's imagine that we have a queue of soldiers here. And these are their names, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And their military transport arrives. And they're ordered to board the transport. And they board the transport in a disciplined way. So we know that number one is still next to number two as in the queue. So we have an atomic correspondence between positions inside the bus and positions in the queue. A coordinated movement of atoms. Okay, so that's Martin's transformation or the growth of beta. Now notice that if soldiers one and two don't like each other, they have no choice. Yeah. So there will be a lot of strain energy involved in such a transformation. So this is what we call a military transformation, mud inside a brain. Now, by contrast, things like perlite or electromorphic ferrite, you have a queue of civilians here. Yeah? When the bus arrives, they just rush on board <laughs> and they sit next to their friends, so strain energy is <coughs> minimized and we've lost atomic correspondence. Okay. But there is a third kind of transformation. So we had military, we had civilian. We also have paramilitary, where the amount of discipline is between that of the military and civilians. And that is here. You see, we have these small atoms which don't behave themselves. You know, they go wherever they like. This is the carbon atoms. Okay. So it is possible for the crystal structure to be changed like in martensite, but at the same time for carbon to diffuse because carbon is in interstitial position. So this is what we call paramilitary transformation. So I want to now explain to you the difference. We've explained the difference between bainite and martensite. I want to explain the difference between bainite and Wiedmannstadt and ferrite. Wiedmannstadt and ferrite, you know, grows at a higher temperature, frequently above the T0. So there's no question that it can grow without diffusion. 
So, you've all seen micrographs of Greenland stratum ferrite, and it looks like a thin wedge shape. Yeah. And sometimes it grows directly from the austenite grain boundaries, at other times it grows from layers of ferrite present at the grain boundaries. But this thin wedge shape is important. And uh, this is a, a micrograph showing you length of the Greenland stratum ferrite. Okay. Notice one thing, OK? Uh, this is, again, an optical micrograph. This time, this doesn't appear dark. It's etching nice and white. There isn't structure inside those plates, as in Vega. Yes. Uh, Watson and McDougall did measurements of the shape deformation. And this is an interference micrograph showing you, again, there is a shear deformation. The, the actual shape change is slightly complicated. This is what we expect with martensite or bainite. But this is what we get with weakness and current. It actually consists of two plates which are compensating each other by shearing in not exactly opposite directions, but different directions. Because these are two different variants, crystallographic variants, you get this thin wedge shape, because this is a different plane from this. And we should have a boundary in between those two planes. Then you need, when you look in a transmission electron microscope, you find the boundary in optically what appears to be a single plane. So it's a very clever transformation that it cancels out the strain energy by two planes forming. Now, why doesn't martensite form like that? Why doesn't bainite form like that and cancel out the strain energy? Well, there is a cost. You have to nucleate those two plates at the same time. And that's why the structure that we get with Wiedemann's and ferrite is coarser. You will get a lower nucleation rate because you have to have the right two variants nucleating at the same time. 